Okay. We'll keep going where we stopped yesterday. Uh, still thinking about how it was about solving the constraint equations. And I'm getting used to this room apparently. So, yesterday I stopped with uh, the constraint equations. And with some luck, I'm finding them again. Where we had three scalar curvature plus k squared minus k i j k i j equals 16.0 and t j conversions of k i j minus g i j k equals 8 pi s. So the right hand side here comes from potential matter terms if you're solving for say neutron stars and the left hand side are the gravitational fields the three metric gamma spatial metric and the extrinsic curvature connection and the last thing we managed to do yesterday was uh, we rewrote the spatial metric as a conformal factor times the a conformal metric, and that turned the Hamiltonian constraint into an elliptic equation for the conformal factor. P triple squared of psi equals more terms. What all these extra terms are doesn't really matter very much, unless you actually get about trying to put them on the computer, because then you have to cope all these terms. Minus two pi more side. And then we went off and did some very first solutions of this carbon system by essentially setting Kij to zero and making more simplifying assumptions on, on uh, the chromometric to end up with black hole solutions where the black holes are <coughs> um, Of course, we now were to evolve these forward in time. Black holes initially at rest would fall towards each other and we would have a head on merging. So now we want to do better because we also want to put in black hole spin and black hole boosts that the black holes are actually moving. And to do that, we need to think more carefully about the second equation, the, the momentum constraint, and play the same trick we played with the Hamiltonian constraint, um, decompose our, our variables into smaller pieces uh, in such a way that some of these smaller pieces are completely constrained because of and the trick for the extrinsic curvature is to first split off uh, its trace and then to uh, conformally scale this trace free part of the extrinsic curvature with a factor of psi to the minus 10. And you shouldn't be asking why psi to the minus 10. The reason for the psi to the minus 10 is uh, that it meshes very nicely with the conformal decomposition of the matter. If you compute the divergence of AI chain, that is 
equals of the psi to the minus 10. A twin light shape. And now the way the powers of psi work out, um, it turns out that this expression is the same as the conformal divergence with the power upside to the minus 10 moved the other side. And so this identity here will allow us to turn the physical divergence, which depends on the conformal factor, which we don't know yet, into a conformal divergence, which only depends on the conformal metric, which we plan to to keep as the free data, so we specify the ahead of time. The next step is to use, to decompose the A delta further into a, what's called a longitudinal piece. and into a transverse traceless piece. So let me write down what I mean by these two magic words. <coughs> Longitudinal is a certain operator acting on a vector. And this is a certain combination of derivatives. It is the symmetrized derivative, all of them with respect to the conformal metric. And then the trace removed. quantity here, that is first of all traceless, but that, that is no big surprise because we started out traceless, uh, but it's, it is also transverse, which is a fancy word for saying it is divergence free. Similar like the TT uh, in gravitational wave decompositions. So we've now split our K with six degrees of freedom into a trace and five degrees in the, in the, in the trace free part. And we've split the trace free part into a vector with three degrees of freedom and the AIJTT piece, which has two degrees of freedom because it satisfies four extra requirements. What's the VI here? VI is a vector, a vector potential that turns out to be useful. That's the point that you have soon to be solving for. So if you plug all these things now into the momentum constraint. Are this now supposed to be these parallel with the definition of LV? Thank you. They should be these, yes. All of these are spatial derivative operators. So plugging all of this into the momentum constraint, what do we get? Um, So we have the d, d j of a aij minus two thirds gamma i j k. Just plugging in this composition here, and now I do the next step, going to the a delta is. 
psi to the minus 10 conformal derivative of a tilde i j minus, well, the second term, that one is just going to hang around gamma i j partial j k. But it looks a lot simpler since k is a scalar, so the covariant derivative turns into a partial derivative. And now working more on the first part, we have the divergence acting on LV I chain. Plus we have the divergence acting on a delta I J D T, which immediately cancels. And we still have the minus two thirds gamma I J K. And so multiplying through by psi to the minus 10. Just a partial derivative using the last term. Thank you. Multiplying through by psi to the minus 10. Um, we still have the divergence of this longitudinal operator. For the second term, we get a psi to the 6, because the other four powers of psi I'm going to absorb into replacing the physical metric by the conformal metric. And we still have on the right hand side meta terms if we happen to have meta in the system. And the nice thing about this equation now is that this here is essentially, this is a, a nice elliptic operator. It's often called the longitudinal Laplacian. And it is elliptic. So that's a nice equation to solve for, for the vector potential. And so the, the overall strategy is now to choose a few of these three pieces, namely the conformal metric, Let's just write it separately. We choose the conformal metric. We choose K. We choose AIJTT. choose boundary conditions that enforce the physics we are interested in, like black holes. Then one solves um, the two elliptic equations that we have left over, this one here outside, and this one here uh, for, for V. This is in general four coupled PTEs. And then one assembles uh, the physical solution one's actually interested in. Uh, gamma ij as psi to the 4 
gamma trigger ij and kij is given by the lengthy formula <coughs> over there. A psi to the minus 10, L trigger by ij plus A trigger by ij tt plus the trace piece. That point on its own. <clears throat> Can you somehow expect any kind of a zone freeze in your uh, form of your Yeah. Yes. So just I can stop thinking about it. Since I have like all this freedom, maybe you could do like the other way around and impose V to be some kind of a healing factor in the form of free metric and then instead impose that instead of choosing. Um, I haven't heard of this one being done. It's an interesting idea. What worries me is how generic types of divisional data you can then still construct if you assume isometries and that way fix, fix the vector B. What is often being done, actually, is still avoiding to solve the momentum constraint. So let's try and actually explain how the two most important types of initial data fit into this, this setup. So the one type of initial data that's used quite widely goes under the name of partial data. There we start out with Simplifying assumptions again, the formal metric is flat. And the trace of the extrinsic curvature is zero. And AIJDT is also zero. Now we are in a situation where uh, flat derivative of the flat longitudinal operator is zero. And it turns out that uh, there is a set of nice solutions for this. Uh, both for vectors, and then the next step further for the AI shape potential. They come in two different ways. One of them has a, a vector p in it, 3 over 2 r squared bi and j, j, and i minus a symmetric trace free tensor. Um, B, k, and k. Here, p is, is a constant. R is 1 over x minus wherever we want uh, the black hole to be at the end of the day. And n is a unit vector pointing away from the location of the black hole. And if you plug this into your uh, divergence condition for, for A tilde, you will notice that this does satisfy if it is convert, uh, divergence for The second high solution that's floating around is has a spin in it, and I 
epsilon j kl and k sl. And both of these satisfy the momentum constraint. And because the momentum constraint is linear, an arbitrary combination of those things are also going to satisfy the momentum constraint. So we end up with an extrinsic curvature that is the sum of uh, however many black holes you happen to have of uh, the P terms and the J terms and the S terms. We have not yet solved the momentum of the, the, the Hamiltonian constraint but it turns out, even before solving it, we can make sense of what these constants uh, P, S and P are. Apparently, I again show some that it's very difficult to move from. Let's switch color. Um, can you look at the ABM uh, momentum? So that's, let's say, surface integral at infinity or near infinity. That is going to tell us the total amount of linear momentum in this particular hypersurface, in our initial data hypersurface. You might have seen this formula in, a, in your general relativity class. If you now plug in the decomposition for, for Ki chain for Ai chain, um, first of all, uh, trace of K is zero, then the Ki chain turns into a psi to the minus 10 A trickle I chain, the A chain. And far away, the conformal factor is going to be 1. So the conformal factor drops out of this integral. And if I'm Giving this a more concrete name than just a delta, if I'm putting the letters here for New York, <laughs> then these here are the for New York um, uh, extrinsic curvatures that we've just defined. And it turns out, if you evaluate the surface integral, you have in the p terms 1 over r squared 4 over towards infinity. Your volume element grows like, one of, grows like r squared, so the powers of r work out. And this actually turns into the sum of each of the momenta p that you specified up here in this expression. So, if you only have a single black hole, 
Um, this p term is Lijp represents the linear momentum of the black hole. And if you have multiple black holes, you get the sum of it, because uh, as it turns out, on this level, uh, the constraint equations are linear enough that you, you just get a sum. There's a similar expression for the IDM angular momentum. And if you evaluate that expression, turns out what you find is you find the sum of the individual S vectors that go into the second expression here. So this looks like uh, for a single black hole, the total angular momentum would be the parameter S that goes into this expression, so we have the, the angular momentum of the black hole. Plus, there's a second term here, and that is a inner product epsilon i k l XL black hole alpha P black hole alpha L. So this is basically a X black hole cross P P alpha type contribution. And that takes account of the point about which you measure the angular momentum. If you measure the point the angular momentum around zero, as does the formula for the ADM angular momentum, and you have a body offset from zero with linear angular momentum, it will sh with linear momentum, it will show up as an X cross P contribution to the, to the angular momentum. So, looks like we have extrinsic curvature terms that look quite nicely like they could carry linear angular momentum for our black holes that we might be end ending up constructing soon. As we had yesterday for the solution without any momentum, and then we said a tilde equal to zero, we now need to think about what we want to have for the conformal factor. Uh, thinking about psi, we uh, want psi to go to infinity at each black hole. Yesterday we had, uh, for, for the non moving solutions yesterday, we had psi equals m over 2r. So we still want the same blow up on over R near each black hole. And we need to get this somewhere into the equation and use get appropriate conditions at each black hole to get this blow up from the fourth side. And the most interesting trick of how to do this uh, was developed by Brandt and Brückmann they were simply writing psi as the terms that we wanted to have there for each black hole you're writing a term like the close up and then we're adding a correction u If I'm calling this first term here um, 1 over a, then we have that a goes to zero 
at each at each of the black holes. Because we have the storm is flowing up at each black hole, and if you're taking the inverse, the inverse goes to zero. If you're now substituting this ansatz into the moment into the Hamiltonian constraint, we have a Laplacian of psi, one of our R terms top out. So the uh, Hamiltonian constraint turns into a Laplacian of U. And then there is this psi to the minus 7 times Ai J term, the factor 1 eighth in front of it. And if you pull out powers of A, you can write this as Uh, a to the 7 times a i j delta squared. And now we still need to do the rest of the psi terms. And they then turn into a 1 plus a u to the minus 7 equals 7 zero. And so the nice thing now here is that a chain a delta O in U of U up like one over R cubed for the spin terms. So this can go like one over R to the six because it's a square near each function. But we have an overall factor A to the seventh here, which is actually falling off more quickly at each function, cancelling this the singular terms. So this thing here behaves like x minus x black hole alpha near each black hole. Nice and well behaved. Despite psi itself uh, blowing up at the function. And it turns out the second term here is also finite. And it turns out, and Pantene put one also proved this in 898, that you can just solve this equation on R3 and without any regards to the black holes, and you can that way get a solution. So you have your whole space. You're putting somewhere, say, two black holes. X black hole one. It has some linear momentum. It has some spin. Uh, you might have a second black hole. X black hole two. Again with uh, linear momentum, and again with spin. And on the level of solving the Hamiltonian constraint now for you, um, you have a certain source term floating around that actually vanishes at, at the locations of your black holes. And so you can solve in, in the entire space a Laplace equation and that way compute you. And this type of so-called puncture data uh, underlies almost all of the black hole simulations that are done these days worldwide, except for the ones that SPEC are doing. The biggest problem of the puncture initial data is that it only works for only is capable of constructing initial data with spins of about at maximum 
here. So the advantage of puncture data Uh, it's it's quite simple. Um, any number of black holes, uh, any momentum and any spins of the black holes. But the disadvantage after you have solved the constraints. From a, the, the physical black hole spin is, well, uh, the spin you're specifying divided by the mass of the black hole squared. And those can only be as big as about 0.93 in puncture. The reason for that is the initial assumption of conformal flatness. It turns out curved black holes do not have conformally flat slices through them. And so by assuming conformal flatness, you have immediately built in a deviation from the true solution. And as you increase the spin and try to get closer and closer to extremo, this deviation becomes more and more pronounced and makes the method stop at about spins of 0.93. Does he also happen in the gas So the, this, is, this is the initial data that is used now for BSSN evolutions. So all PSSN evolutions done to date have this limit that they only work with spins up to 0.93. Very, very recently, over the last year or so, the Rochester group has managed to generalize puncture data to work for spins larger than 0.93. But this is really very new stuff. They've done one or two simulations so far with spins of 0.95. Everything seems to work, but we'll have to see how it stands the test of time. Practical level, the momentum uh, spins shown in makes sense at infinity. Locally, do you get, tend to get black holes with spins that are proximal to the spin set, and are the velocities, coordinate velocities, proximally the coordinate velocities of the set? Yes, so locally you get co coordinate. So the, the biggest, okay, so th there's three things going on here. One is you can define quasi local. Uh, spin for each black hole. And because of the assumptions that go into the, in, into the, into this uh, puncture data, especially again, gamma tilde is flat and expensive curvature is zero, therefore the quasi-local spin is indeed the spin parameter one is feeding into the black holes. Um, for the for linear momentum, I'm still not aware of a of a good definition of quasi-local linear momentum. So I'm, I'm not aware of any similar relation. But the big thing that's different is that the mass of the black hole is not equal to the mass that was fed in into the puncture. So you can control the spin of the black hole, you know what the angular momentum is, but this MA alpha here is what is called the puncture mass. And that is not equal to the physical mass of the black hole after solving the constraints. And so it's, it's that this mass is different that you then 
actually need to work a little bit in that if you want to get the dimensionless spin um, of the black hole, that one you can only compute after you have solved the constraints. And the linear momentum works quite well in the sense that the black holes actually behave and move as you would expect them to move. I have no idea whether, they, whether the velocity is more appropriate for uh, the black hole mass or the bare mass. I don't know much data well enough. So there's a second approach to doing initial data. And that's the conformal and sandwich approach. So here the desire is, is we want to specify still a conformal metric but we also want to specify the time derivative of the conformal You might ask, why would you want to do that? And the reason is that if you have two black holes, say in circular orbits, in the co-rotating frame, rotating along with the black holes, then the time derivatives should be zero. So it's, it's actually quite nice in that we get some of the free data one has to choose without actually having to make uh, choices. The way this works, if you insist on specifying gamma tilde and dt of gamma tilde, is that you now use the definition of kij. If you remember, kij had a term in it that was the time derivative of gamma hj. And from that definition, you can then work out that the extrinsic curvature will take the form psi to the minus 10, 1 over 2 alpha delta, L trigger delta i j, plus 1 third gamma i j. So this form looks very, very similar to what we had before now. We have the same factor psi to the minus 10, we have the same L operator acting on the vector, and we have the trace piece. But because we have specified, insisted on specifying d by dt, the variables that are showing up here now suddenly are the shift vector, and this alpha delta is a conformal lapse. So an alpha delta is psi to the minus 6 times alpha, and alpha is the lapse function. So the decomposition of Ki chain looks similar like the one I had beforehand, and so if you're now plugging this into the momentum constraint, um, we will find a quite similar looking equation, namely Covariant convergence of, of beta ij equals other terms. So far, so good. Also, still the choice of k is a free, free choice. And now we have 
the difficulty that we have beta being specified by the momentum constraint, but we have this alpha delta suddenly floating around in the elapsed function, for which we don't yet have an equation of fixed. It turns out you can use the, the evolution equation for Kli J From that, you can derive an evolution equation for K. And that evolution equation for K, if, you, if you're looking back at your notes yesterday about the ADN equations, will have a term built in that has a minus Laplacian acting on, on, on the lapse. So the trick is to also specify, to also demand to specify the time derivative of k. And then take this expression here, one of the ADM evolution equations, and rewrite that to get a, a equation for, for the lapse. And so that expression can be written as a covariant Laplacian. It's, it looks nicest if you throw in a factor of uh, psi to the 7. Because then terms combine nicely. Um, and there is one more term. The precise form actually doesn't really matter much. So now we are in a situation where we have um, these three data here. Well, the nice thing is, we're just setting the CMO of half of the three data we had. No need to worry about how to fix them. And then we have to solve five equations. So choose gamma delta IJ, K, uh, and the time derivatives. Solve d triple uh, Laplace equation for psi, uh, a somewhat more complicated equation for the shift, and a Laplace equation for the conformal labs, and then again assemble. Uh, the full solution gamma ij and k ij. So, this time around, let me start with the disadvantages. Uh, we have five couple of PDEs. So it's not as easy to solve this numerically as it was to do the puncture data. And I should point out when I was talking about the puncture data, somebody asked me about spins bigger than 0 0.93. And I mentioned the Rochester folks. And in order to get beyond the 0 0.93, they also have to solve a more complicated set of equations, of at least four equations. So the, the really nice simplicity goes away there as well. Um, on the plus side, we still have the freedom to choose any conformal metric we like 
And the choice that's been quite famous these days is to choose the conformal metric based on curl black holes. Kind of a superposition of, say, two curl black holes. And that way, we can build in the appropriate deformation away from conformal flatness that is needed to get spins a lot bigger than 293. The other big advantage, at least for, for the spec side of things, is we get a lapse and a shift. So we get initial values for the gauge conditions for the subsequent evolution. that approach, um, spec, we were able to do, it, to do initial data with uh, spins as big as 0.9999. There might be another one. I, I forgot how many. And the biggest evolution spin we have right now has a spin, black hole spins of 0.9998. So those similar uh, evolutions are still quite difficult to do, but they are becoming possible. And did I actually plug things in? So you might ask, why do I actually care to go bigger than 0.93? It seems already quite close to the maximum black hole spin of 1. Um, but as you approach extremal black holes, if you look at the various curve formulas that are floating around, uh, they always have a factor of square root of 1 minus s over m squared in it. So for, for spins very close to unity, um, and, and almost all quantities related to the black holes behave uh, like, a, like a turned over parabola, like a square root of uh, the distance to one. This plot, for instance, shows the amount of rotational energy in a black hole at a certain spin compared to the rotational energy of a black hole of the same mass with, with extremal spin. And at, at, at spin of 0.93, you are at about 60% only of the maximum rotational energy a black hole can have. So in, in terms of, of, say, this quantity, the rotational energy, your spin of 0.93 is, is remarkably far away from extremality. And now with the conformal and sandwich initial data, um, getting up to spins like 0.9095, this gets up, up to about 98% of the rotational energy of curl. So we are a lot closer to extremality than at, at point 0.93. Since I have this up, I can do a little bit of, of showing more about computational methods. Um, this is about the code I've been, I wrote as, as my PhD thesis. <coughs> which was a code to solve the initial value equations. <coughs> As on Monday, we're expanding basis functions. So it's sometimes Fourier series, sometimes Chebyshev series. Uh, near the black holes, we do spherical shells. 
intermediate distances, there's complicated cylinders and other things, and at large distances, there's more spherical shells. So it's a complicated domain decompositional. Uh, for initial data, there's 11 domains, and for evolutions, this is actually an evolution domain decomposition, there's of the order of 50 or 60 different domains. Each one has their own spectral expansion, and, and they're then coupled together with suitable boundary conditions. When you're doing elliptic equations, uh, again, you discretize the equations, but as I pointed out on Monday, elliptic equations are solved all at once. And so solving elliptic equations turns, you, turns into inverting very big matrices where the matrix you need to invert is, is, has the size of the number of degrees of freedom in your solution. Uh, for initial data, this is about 60 or so cubed, so you have matrices of the size of perhaps 100,000 times 100,000 that you need to invert. Um, here's one example of uh, how well the code currently behaves. The error of the initial data solved from the y-axis, the number of grid points on the x-axis, Q root. And you see roughly straight lines here indicating that for the initial data, we actually get the very nice exponential convergence I had advertised the Monday for the spectral methods. And these are uh, not for my PhD thesis anymore, but this is a plot from a paper two or three years ago where uh, Sergei Osokini, postdoc at AI, and previously a, a, a PhD student at CETA, uh, put some effort into improving our initial data code further. And so these are the most extreme cases he tried, spins of 0.9999, uh, and the other one, the red one here, is mass ratio of 50 and spins of 0.95. And so initial data is quite well under control these days. Okay, any questions? Um, so I'm just wondering, is there something um something called a looping puncture or just something else, some other method that tries to improve on accuracy or other things that you mentioned? Um, for initial data, um, not really. So the initial data is these days completely done with, with spectral methods. There's once um, the code I wrote at, uh, during my PhD thesis that's used by spec. And then most other codes use uh, Unsorg's spectral elliptic solver called two punctures. But the initial data is completely done spectrally. And moving punctures is now a way of evolving that initial data forward in time, which is what we are talking about right now next. Okay, so now let's actually talk about evolving stuff, not only constructing initial data. Sorry, before you start evolving, yep. in the, it's the same function initial data. Do you see sharp surfaces in the initial slice? Yes, they are. And are they where they should be? They are where they should be. Okay. So, I, I had my picture here earlier with the two, say, two punctures, and you found you find trapped surfaces, trapped surfaces around your punctures, and the radius of the trapped surfaces is a, it's, it's proportional to the bare mass parameter that you're feeding into the, the puncture data. Slightly different because there are the corrections due to solving the nonlinear constraints and, and due to interactions with the other black holes, but reasonably close. Harold, um, I just want to mention that. Uh, Kyle Slinker, who's over here, um, as well as uh, Mark Hannum and I, the, the paper that's about to get dropped on the archive, that, uh, puts a, move a uh, trumpet into uh, uh, moving black holes. Uh, so it, uh, it gets around the component flatness and uh, cool. knocks the uh, jump radiation down by two orders of magnitude. That's excellent news. <laughs> yes, it's, it's actually astonishing. Some of the things here, 
the, this type of initial data was developed in 20 years ago, in 98. And it has been used since, and there's remarkably few improvements to the initial data constructions, because it worked well enough that everybody went off and, and just used it and explored how black holes collide. Um, the same with the forms and sandwich initial data. This, this is my, my PhD thesis, 2003. We've hap been happily using it since, except, well, a few improvements along the way. And again, even now, Mark Scheel and, and, and one of his students is looking into how to improve this setup further. And it's, it's glad, I'm, I'm glad to hear that on the puncture initial data side, there's also activity going on. Let's talk about evolutions. Um, so we, I derived the ADM equations yesterday. And I won't be spelling them out again, but fundamentally the structure is gamma, the time derivative of gamma i j is k i j. And the time derivative of k i j has, among other things, the Ricci tensor. And in both cases, of course, was other things. And this Ricci tensor, uh, if you work out the terms involved in it, It has what looks like a wave operator, second derivatives of the metric, uh, contracted with the, or uh, looks like a Laplacian operator acting on each component of the metric itself. So this combined with the two time derivatives looks like wave equations, so this, this would be good. But there's also another term floating around here. that has first derivatives of contracted Christoffel symbols. And then there's more drops, which we don't care about. So this one here would turn into a wave operator. And that would be good. But this one here with the Christoffel symbols built in, uh, the gamma k is a trace of the of the of the uh, a trace, trace of the Christoffel symbols, and so because of that, we have here also second derivatives, and these are of a bad form. Those are the ones. Would make the system weakly like a boy. This is completely spelled wrong, isn't it? I uh, And so these, these, this term here is the one that's actually bad if you evolved just the ADM equations yourself. In hindsight, Everything looks so easy, and one wonders why it took decades to figure it out. But hindsight is always better than than, than, than foresight. So now the way to get around this: there's a few different things we can, few different games one can play to make the evolution equation better behaved. What we need to pay attention to are the highest order spatial derivatives. Because those are the ones that determine uh, hyperbolicity in, in the math mathematical structure of the equations. And so there's basically three important strategies um, to modify the equations. One can change variables. Uh, 
one can add multiple of the constraint equations. The constraints are supposed to be satisfied, but they have spatial derivatives in them. And so by, by adding essentially zero in form of the constraints, we can change the second order or the derivative terms in the evolution equations. And the third strategy is we can introduce new variables. And on the way to the BSSN equations, all three of these approaches are done. BSSN stands for the S and the N is Shibata Nakamura. in 1995, and the PNDS is Baumgartner Shapiro, in 1998, who improved the previous evolution system written down by Shibata and Nakamura. And if you put everything together, uh, what BSSN does at the end of the day is, as I said, they introduce new, the change variables. So we are writing the spatial metric as e to the 4 phi times the IQ formal metric, which has unit determinant. And we are also splitting the extrinsic curvature into once more a trace piece and a uh, trace free piece, where the trace free piece gets once again um, conformally changed by a factor in front of it. So the, the, that's part of the thing for that was these important transformations were already in the original SN95 paper. And then you end up with a bunch of evolution equations for the conformal factor for um, the conformal metric, for um, for the, the time derivative of the trace of k, and also finally for the trace-free conformal metric. And this trace-free conformal metric, it basically is the extrinsic curvature, and it still has in it the Ricci, scale, Ricci tensor with the nice term and the not so nice term. So in this expression, the time derivative of the extrinsic curvature there still will be something like a second derivative, time deriv a second spatial derivative of the metric in the form of a Laplacian, and there still will be the nasty terms, gamma ki dj gamma k plus other stuff. So, so far, um, in the 95 Shibata Nakamura paper, this evolution system already worked quite a bit better than, than did the ADM equations, but it didn't work completely. And so the, the final trick that was put in by Baumgart and Shapiro in 98 are to introduce new variables, namely to decide we have here this nasty term, and if I consider this nasty term as a shorthand 
for some other terms that have the metric in it, then this term has the nasty second derivatives. But if I now promote the gamma bar k to, to, to new variables, with their own evolution equations, then suddenly what used to be second derivatives of, of the spatial metric are now only first derivatives of our new variables. And so by this trick of, of just calling the gamma a new variable, what used to be a nasty second order term has now disappeared from the equations. And so this set of writing the Einstein evolution equations is now coupled with very specific gauge conditions which were found by uh, a mixture of, of intuition and physical insights and arguments and a lot of trial and error. Um, I'll write them down, but just writing them down won't really tell you too much. The lapses is involved with the, the first order evolution equation 2 alpha k, which goes under the name of 1 plus log slicing. And the shift is involved with a set of two coupled equations, dt beta i equals 3 quarters capital B and dt capital B i equals dt gamma bar i minus beta beta i. And this, this is called gamma driver. Shift. And this is now the set of equations that is evolved in all the uh, BSSN moving function. Um, there's a few small variations in the set of equations how different groups are writing this. Um, some define the phi as I've done here, others put in another minus sign in the definition of phi so that phi actually stays, goes to zero at, at the punctures rather than blowing up. But that's, that's the overall scheme there. And the nice thing is that the way slices behave near the black hole singularities um, one can actually evolve this, this specific set of evolution equations with this specific set of boundary condition, uh, of gauge conditions without having to worry about the black holes. The black holes are nice and stable, they, they stay on the grid somewhere and, and don't mess up the rest of the evolution. It's a remarkably stable and, and simple way of solving Einstein's equations. One question. For data, what would you think is the best option? So for the eta parameter, do you the I, I don't know BSSN well enough to give you opinions on how, how to choose eta. <laughs> I think uh, uh, Baumgart and Shapiro in the book, they mentioned that eta is, is chosen proportional to one over the mass of the space-time or one of the mass of the black hole. But I'm, I'm not an expert in, in, in choices of eta. Okay, I think now is a good time to, to for a break, and then we can talk about the second way of solving Einstein's equations with uh, the Chinois harmonic equations 
that Pretorius actually introduced in 2005. But let's break for coffee first. <laughs>